So good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, Ganga virtual webinar series. Uh, we have today a very interesting topic on giant cell tumor management, and we have excellent faculty to speak to us on the topic. So let me first introduce the faculty. We have uh, Dr. Raja Vaskar Rajshekran with us. He's a clinical fellow at Oxford Bone and Soft Tissue Tumor Service in UK and he's a Gerdelson Scholar at the University of Oxford. So welcome, Rajan. Thank you, sir. We also have Dr. Pushpa. Uh, she has uh, done specialty training at uh, Stanmore UK and also a fellow of Royal College of Radiology. She is currently uh, working at uh, Ganga Hospital with special interest in musculoskeletal radiology. So welcome, Dr. Pushpa. We also have with us Dr. Devendra. He is an associate consultant in trauma at Ganga Hospital. And he is a recipient of five gold medals in state and national meetings. So far. Chapters, uh, co author of various chapters and publications in trauma. So, welcome to you, Dr. Devendra. Thank you, sir. We also have with us uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar T. He is a consultant, surgical oncologist, and laparoscopy surgeon at Ganga Hospital with a varied interest in musculoskeletal oncology. So welcome to you, Dr. Sunil. Yeah, thank you. And last but not the least, we have Professor Dr. S. Raj Shikharan. He's a clinical director and head at the Department of Orthopedics at Ganga Hospital. Welcome to you, sir. And now I hand it over to Dr. Raj Shikharan for further proceedings. Over to you, sir. So you are muted. Good evening to all of you. I'm glad that we could all be connected uh, together across the country and outside. Thanks to Ashok, Ortho TV, and also in a way to COVID because these things were not happening before. And. Uh, one of the other good things that have happened is across the borders and across the time, educational activities have gone on to a level as never before. And we at Ganga, we have been not only going full steam with the clinical work, but also have been quite active on the academic front. And today I have a great pleasure in having this seminar on one of the very important topics. And especially for students also, it's very important because this is an often discussed topic in theory exams. They get cases in clinicals and also in the radiology in the afternoon. This is a very favorite subject for all the examiners. So we will go very systematically and starting off with the clinical features and what all you have to be aware of on the clinical side. And then we will systematically go on to the radiology, how to diagnose a giant cell tumor and how to differentiate it from its clinical variants. And then Dr. Devendra will talk about surgical management of GCT in the uh, long bones, followed by a lecture by me on giant cell tumors of the spine. And our oncologist, Dr. Sunil, We'll discuss on a very important topic on non-operative management and drug therapy. I mean, drugs like denosumab has radically changed our approach to this disease, which we once thought is purely surgical. And it has completely changed and revolutionized the way we think about it. So we will start off with it. I'll first invite uh, Dr. Raja Bhaskar to talk about what are the clinical, clinically important things that you need to be observant when you see a giant cell tumor? Over to you, Raju Bhaskar. Thank you, sir. So is my screen seen? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's seen. So uh, I, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ashok Sham, sir, who was also my teacher and mentor in Sancheti Institute and who's been running Auto TV for this excellent initiative of Auto TV. And today I'll be talking on giant cell tumor of bone and what are the clinical considerations? Like any of 
orthopedic surgeon or any radiologist, any oncologist will be aware of giant cell tumor, the general aspects of it. But what does a lesion, if you see a patient with giant cell tumor in your clinic or when they come to you, what are the things which will influence you and what are the things which are needed to get a good outcome and to be addressed during management? And I'm a clinical fellow in the musculoskeletal oncology unit at the University of Oxford at the Nuffield Orthopedic Center at present. As you know, giant cell tumor, the incidence, there are so many different incidences, but this is the one which has been quoted in the WH show. Uh, this is 1.7 per 1 million population. So how do you, let us take it in different perspective. In the city of Mumbai, for example, they have an 18 million population. What this number quotes is there are about 35 to 40 cases which happen every year. Or if we take the city of London, for example, which has a population of about 8.9 million, it's around 25 cases which come there. This does not include the referred cases. So basically what it is, is in the large spectrum of sarcoma, the incidence of bone tumors are 1%. So it is really, really rare. Bone tumors and sarcoma are rare. And in that 1%, giant cell tumors have like, you know, they have a 1.7% uh, incidence in 1 million population. And in primary tumors, there is about 20%. So out of the bone tumors happening, there is 21% are giant cell tumors. And as we know regarding the incidence, now uh, regarding the occurrence and the usual age of it is the third decade, the second end of the second decade and the third decade. So 20 to age 40 is the highest preponderance, nearly 86%. And the characteristic appearance as seen in this X-ray of the distal radius is this epiphyseal metaphyseal region or having a soap purple expansile lesion. That's how the postgraduates, the examiners like epiphyseal metaphyseal region with an expansile region. And there is a few studies which show that there is a female preponderance of 53.4%, which is many minimal. So with this basic thing, which everyone knows of it having 20% uh, incidence in bone tumors, high incidence in the third decade, and with its location, we'll go into the next slide. And so for example, when we come across a lesion suspected to be a giant cell lesion, an osteolytic lesion in the metaphyseal epiphyseal region, in this case, it's proximal tibia and a distal femur. How do we go about it? Like usually 75% of the giant cell tumors, they occur in this region. The highest incidence is the distal femur followed by the proximal tibia. And then we have, it can even occur in the phalanges of the bones. But there is a 10% incidence in spine and in the sacrum areas, which are very difficult to manage. And that will also be covered in this talk. So how do you diagnose a giant cell tumor? So when a patient comes, usually this was actually an epidemiological st study done in Norway, where they found out that 73% of bone tumors, especially they come to a surgeon only by reference. So the general practitioner has seen it and then they order an X-ray. So getting a giant cell tumor directly referred or directly coming and seeing you for the first time is quite rare with today's modern healthcare systems. So how do you diagnose giant cell tumor? The most important symptom of any cancer, having non-mechanical pain, especially night pain, that will be the preceding symptom. And once, the first important thing is to take a radiograph, a complete anteroposterior and a lateral X-ray. So you need a two-dimensional radiograph of the affected limb. And once the radiograph, you can take CT scan and an MRI. So with this, you can do the local staging and diagnosis radiologically of a giant cell tumor. So many people ask, are there any blood tests for giant cell tumor? The only blood test which we should think is a serum parathyroid hormone, just to rule out a Brown's tumor. Like Brown's tumor, it will have diffuse osteolytic lesions. And if you are concerned about that, you need to do a parathyroid hormone. Otherwise, there is nothing else you need to do. There are a few markers which are being uh, introduced by histopathologists in history specific for variants of giant cell tumor. That is quite extended. And, but the gold standard for a giant cell tumor is whatever radiologically you think you have to do a biopsy. 
biopsy and histopathological diagnosis is the gold standard. As they say, if tumor is the rumor, tissue is an issue. There are a few tumors like chondroid CD tumors, like chondrosarcoma and chondroma, where you do not need biopsy. Just radiology is enough. But in giant cell tumor, because of the variance there, you need to rule out all the, you don't miss out anything. So definitely a biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosis. So then once we come to biopsy, what type of biopsy? A fluoroscopic guided needle biopsy with a J needle, it can be done. And a J needle biopsy where you get at least four to five cores. But as we know, the basic principles, the six basic principles of doing biopsy in tumors, the, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to go back on that. So when, with these six principles, for example, in a 35-year-old male, if we have this X-ray at presentation of uh, expansile lytic lesion and you suspect a giant cell tumor, you can either go, as they say, medially or laterally. But the most important thing in this case is you have to plan your biopsy, seeing the lesion and what is going to be your surgery. So the plan of surgery has to be uh, taken into account. And for example, in this case, it's also a pathological fracture. You will need to do an extended curatage. The medial column, the weight-bearing column, it needs to be supported. So you will need to do a medial plating. So in this case, you will need to go on having a medial biopsy. You need to go in through the medial compartment. So the entire biopsy planning has to be done with your further surgery in mind because bion cell tumor is a benign spectrum with an aggressive lesion. So you need to plan your biopsy based on the further surgical plan. And as I said, the final surgery plan. So in this case, we took a, we planned finally for a medial plating with allografts after extended curatage. So we went in medial. And so a medial biopsy was done here. The next important thing, how do you stage these? And the very well-known and renowned Campanacci staging. And you know, a grade one is a cystic lesion with the expansile cortices with intact cortices. And these lesions are in the early stages, but are vis visualized better in the MRI. Stage two, it's an expansile lesion, but the cortex is still thin. At stage three, these are the ones which most, at most times they come, patients come directly with you. They have a destructive radiolucent lesion and break in cortex, and there is a soft tissue extension. So grade two and grade three are the ones the patient will present to you with pain. Grade one, usually they don't have pain. It is sometimes even an incidental diagnosis. So as you know, Campanacci's radiological grading, but you know, this was uh, laid out long time before, but nowadays with modern imaging and with modern techniques, we also have the Enneking staging of a benign GCT, which is collaborative with the Campanacci's grading, like stage one is collaborative with stage grade one. So, Grade three is the one which is about 10, 15%, which has the rapidly gr growing cortex perforated. So a stage three anything is almost reminiscent of a stage three capana. So once you do the biopsy, this is a, an example of a histopathological slide where you see the numerous giant cells which are seen there. And the Jaffe staging, staging system is one more system where they have three different grades where the number of cells and the cellular TPI, ATPI is seen into consideration. So it is also important for you to discuss with your oncopathologist and also for the pathologist to be experienced in this, where they can pick up the stage and also see the cellular ATPI. And as you know, giant cells are not neoplastic. They are primitive non, the non stromal cells. They affect the rank ligand pathway. And depending on the cellular ATPI pathology, because this directly has an influence on the recurrence of the tumor. So you also have to be very aware of these mimicking lesions and chondroblastoma and even multiple fluid lives cavity. A secondary ABC could be mimicking a giant cell tumor and also a multiple myeloma can mimic giant cell tumor. In the next talk, Dr. Pushpa will detail talk in detail about the radiology, so I'm not going into that. But there's if these lesions, if you mistake it also, you principle of management almost the same. Multiple myeloma, good drug therapy. But the one thing you have to be worried about is telling the KP osteosarcoma, which is a high-grade variety of an osteosarcoma, less than 4% of incidence. And in this for this X-ray, which is a proximal tibia lesion, this turned out to be a telangiectatic osteosarcoma. So 
it is more important for your, you to be aware of this and also for your radiologist and also for your pathologist to be aware and then take a decision. So this was a 17 year old girl who had pain and swelling for the past two months. And this is expansive, if you see the x-ray, an expansile lytic lesion, looks like a Campanacci type three on, and many of them would think it as a GCT, which is what it looks like. But if you take the MRI scan, if you see apart from the fluid filled cavity, there is a specific region of doubt to the clinician. And so when you are doing a biopsy through the lateral approach, you have to target this biopsy under fluoroscopic guidance. So nowadays in centers, even when radiologist takes biopsy, you have to take this region particularly, or else if you take the other samples, you may get a false result and you may miss the diagnosis because the treatments for malignant ones are completely different. The next important thing is staging of a GCT. Once you've confirmed it as a GCT, Local staging, uh, radiographs and two-dimensional radiographs and MRI scan is enough. C so CT scans, the role is actually exact, just to find out the cortical thickness exactly. So if you have a pathological fracture, sometimes it may help, but the first two, the radiology, X-rays and the radiographs are enough. For systemic staging, there's been numerous papers that they discussed for the whole body. They used to take PET scans, bone scans, but Nowadays, it's been proved that if you have a single chest X-ray before surgery, that is enough. And a chest X-ray is ideal for the systemic staging of a GCT prior to surgery. And management of GCT has always been surgery. You need to do an intralesional surgery. As we know, the four types of surgery, marginal, intralesional, wide excision. So you need, just need to do an intralesional surgery. And an extended curatage has been shown to be the gold standard where you have to do complete curatage with a high speed burr. And that today, in today's world, there is also the medical legal part where if you get a recurrence, there is always a question whether the high speed burr was used. So because it gives adequate thermocoagulation and also helps in good disease clearance. So of 60,000 RPM and adjuvants, whether phenol or hydrogen peroxide, Chlorexidin, there has been so many discussion on it, many people for it and many people against it, but there is no doubt on the use of a high-speed bird and sandwich technique with cement. So the gold standard of management is surgery. And of course, Sunil will be talking on unresectable GCTs where of sacrum, pelvis, and spine. And with the wonder drug, Denosumab in 2012, which changed treatment, whether it's really effective and also in these unresectable GCTs, prior to denosumab, they were doing a lot of interventional embolization, which is even done in many centers today. So the next question, which a clinician is very much concerned is, do GCTs have a risk of metastasis? So like malignant tumors, and even if a patient, you have a patient, the patient is going to ask you, what is the rate of metastasis I have? So I'll tell this with an example. So this was a 17 year old girl who had an expansile swelling in her in the phalanges of a middle finger. So in the proximal phalanx base, if you see, there is a lytic lesion. They did a biopsy, it was suggestive of GCT. And then after three doses of neoadjuvant therapy of injection denosumab, you could see there is a cortical shell formation happening. Then a curatage was done. And then uh, after the wide excision and also the uh, autograft was used and from the metatarsal head and then they also used a side plate to fix it. The patient had a good outcome and the patient was discharged and then the patient was lost to follow up for a long time. The patient came back after two years. She didn't have much symptoms of her finger, but she had only, she came with a cough during that time. And if you see her x-ray, there is diffuse metastasis seen in her case. And this is also the MRI, a CT scan, sorry, of her chest. So you have to be wary of this fact that there is a three to 5% chance of metastases of this GCT. And it usually occurs at two years and lung is the most common site. But this was a case which was done in one of India's premier center in the Tata Memorial Hospital, where they studied the metastatic giant cell tumor of the bone. And they found that even though they had metastases, the outcome was much favorable than a malignant giant cell tumor, than a malignant disease or like an osteosarcoma metastasis or a heaving sarcoma metastasis. The or the survival was much better. And in, they suggested that in cases where it was possible, you could do 
uh, metastatectomy. You could do a lobectomy of the lung also. Patients did well. So it is very important for clinicians to be aware that GCT of bone can metastasize. There is also a 1% to 2% variant of a GCT, which can be a metastatic GCT. The next question, what is the risk of recurrence in cases of extended curatage after surgery? This was a 34-year-old lady with a biopsy-proven GCT. If you see, it's a Campanacci type 3 with a cortical, thin, cortical breakage. And after neoadjuvant denosumab, there was a good shell cover. And type 3 GCT with soft tissue extension, especially the lateral... If you focus on the lateral image, there is a soft tissue extension here. And in this region, it's always very difficult for you to attain curatage. So extended curatage was done and they had five, six uh, burrings at the entire femur, distal femur. And after cement application, the patient did well, but six months later, the patient had pain. So in such a situation, how do we detect early recurrence? If you do a CT scan or an MRI, MRIs, you know, even if you do a image subtraction or a metal subtraction MRI, there is going to be a lot of image scatter. In such cases, you can do a PET scan, a PET scan. And if you see within six months, the PET scan has a really, the red color indicates a high uptake of the uh, inflammation activity and that suggested recurrence. So in early recurrences, you need to do an extended scan like a PET scan and that will be helpful. So there have been numerous papers on GCT. And if you go through, the, even in the best of hands, with the experience management, with the best of adjuvant therapy, with the best amount of disease clearance, you have a 7% chance of recurrence. Various papers quote between 7% and 44%. So you have to be ideal that there is a chance. You have to be knowledgeable of the fact and also inform patients that you have a chance of recurrence. Numerous factors have been discussed for recurrence. And nowadays, even the use of denosumab has been shown to have a higher recurrence, the initial presentation, intraarticular contamination, pathological fracture. But the one important factor which affects is the adequacy of disease clearance. So you need to make sure, you need to use even dental mirrors to see all areas, all cortices are completely taken. You have cleared the disease. And that is the one factor which affects recurrence. So the last thing, how long should a patient operated from GCT to be followed up. This is a very important, as we have seen in our previous case, if missed follow-ups, you can lead with metastasis. And especially uh, in countries where there is not an established sarcoma service, it's very difficult. But you need to be aware that routine follow-up is a must, especially with the risk of recurrence and with the risk of metastasis. So ideally what is followed is a three-month follow-up for the first two years, followed by a six-month follow-up for the next and then you need to follow up them annually till 10 years. So if you are going to operate on a patient of GCT, you have to be mindful of the fact that at least for 10 years, you need to be followed up and then need to be every, in every X-ray, you need to take an X-ray of the local region, examine them, also take a chest X-ray for screening purpose. And only then can you say that they are disease free. So you need to have a 10 year follow up. So clinic, I would like to summarize my clinical considerations as GCT is a benign but an aggressive lesion and clinicians need to be mindful that type 3 lesions in the Campanacci where there is a soft tissue break and there is a soft tissue extension and with cellular ATP as seen on the histological slides, these are important factors with regards to recurrence. There is a higher chance of recurrence with these. Chest x-ray is enough for preoperative staging of the, the disease. You need to counsel patients regarding recurrence and also be mindful that metastasis is rare, but associated with better outcomes. And surgery, biopsy is the choice for diagnosis and intralesional extended curatage is the gold standard for surgery to attain good outcomes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajabaskar. So that was a very good, uh comprehensive talk on what should be the thought process in a clinician's mind when he sees a giant subtumor. So we will have some of the questions uh, at the end. And so I would request uh, if you can stop sharing your screen and I would request uh, Dr. Pushpa to give a talk on imaging considerations in giant subtumor.
थैंक यू सर Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Good evening to all. Uh, let's start with imaging of giant cell tumor and giant cell tumor variants. So, if I give this X-ray uh, and say this is a 25-year-old uh, individual, and uh, you see a large lytic expansor lesion in epimetaphysis of proximal tibia, which is also having subchondral extension without any tumor matrix, but there are a lot of trabeculations and there is no periosteal reaction. So pretty much everyone will be sure that this is going to be giant cell tumor. As we all know that this is a very common primary bone tumor making up to 20%. So each one of us would have encountered GCT in one time or the other. But it's not always a case because we will have many such mimickers which will mimic GCT and we will be in, in lot of confusion regarding the diagnosis. And radio radiology plays an important role in case of diagnosis of bone tumors. And uh, uh, it has a more importance as compared to histopathology also because histopathology diagnosis also depends on radiology diagnosis. So to come to a decent diagnosis or at least a differential diagnosis, we should run through a checklist. So let's go quickly go through the checklist before we deal with the GCT imaging. So one of the most, most important factor is age. So when before seeing the uh, X-ray and when we talk to the patient, the most critical thing we should ask is what is the age of the patient? And at the top of our mind, we should have, we should know which bone tumor peaks at what age group. So this is very important for the diagnosis of the bone tumors. Coming to GCT, it peaks around the third decade and 80% of the cases occurring between 20 and 50 years of age. And it is very important to note that less than 3% of the cases will appear before 14 years of age. So it is very rare to see a giant cell tumor before 14 years of age. And only 13% of the patients will have GCT over 50 years of age group. So this will help us to narrow down our differential diagnosis. So we should always keep age in the top priority. Second thing is we should combine age and location. So we should know particular tumors in particular location as well as during the age group. So here you can see in the picture where only clear cell chondrosarcoma and chondroblastoma appear in the epiphyseal end of the bone and when the growth plate is not fused. So all aneurysmal bone cyst and osteosarcoma, everything happens only at the metaphyseal end of the bone and it never comes at the subchondral region. Whereas when the epiphysis is fused, we have giant cell tumor, malignant fibrous histiocytoma, and intraosseous ganglion cyst. So we can, we can pretty much by knowing the location predilection of the tumor, as well as age peak of the tumor, we can make pretty much most of the diagnosis of bone tumor. So I have just listed out the tumors here, we're considering the age and subchondral location. So we can see in immature skeleton, the most common uh, lesion would be aneurysmal bone cyst. Again, I'm telling this that aneurysmal bone cyst will be on the metaphyseal end of the uh, bone tumor, uh, bone, whereas chondroblastoma and clear cell chondrosarcoma will be on the epiphyseal end of the bone. So aneurysmal bone cyst and giant cell tumor, if they happen before the fusion of the physis will be on the metaphyseal end. So this is to be remembered very clearly. When the skeleton is matured, the subchondral lesions are typically giant cell tumor, metastasis and plasma cytoma can also occur in this area, but we should all always remember the age group of giant cell tumor. It is basically more in the age group of 30 years and rest of the tumors like metastasis and plasma cytoma are above 50 years of age group. Coming to the various type of uh, rare type of osteosarcomas can also mimic an aggressive type of giant cell tumor. So we should also include these tumors in our differential diagnosis. The one metabolic disease we should not uh, forget is brown tumor. So whenever we see multiple aggressive looking giant cell tumor like lesions, we should always uh, do serum uh, parathyroid hormone to rule out brown tumors. 
So the most common location for GCT is long bones, where in which we can see about 75 to 90 percent of the cases they can happen in long bones, and 50 to 65 percent happen in and around the knee joints. And distal femur proximal tibia and distal radius are most common location in a in decreasing frequency. So next thing we should say is what is tumor doing to the bone? What is the zone of transition and type of bone destruction? So here you can see it is a chondroblastoma, which is typically showing a large lytic area in the epiphysis of the immature skeleton, but it is showing a nice sclerotic border. So this is a narrow zone of transition with a nice sclerotic border, which is never seen in giant cell tumor, except when it is treated, we can have a sclerotic border in case of giant cell tumor. Otherwise, giant cell tumor has a typical geographic type of bone destruction with a distinct border. So you have a narrow zone of transition, but you never see any sclerotic border in case of giant cell tumor. The second pattern will be a ge geographic destruction with a indistinct border. So in the proximal aspect, you have a typical clear border, distinct border, whereas in the distal aspect of the lesion, there is an indistinct border. So when you see such type of lesion and the patient is around uh, the age group of 30 to 50 years, you should also include your differential diagnosis of types of rare types of osteosarcoma like telangiotactic osteosarcomas. So next thing what we have to say is what is bone doing to the tumor? How is the periosteal reaction? So we should always remember giant cell tumor and metastasis plasma cytomas will never have periosteal reaction. Although some type of osteosarcomas which mimic giant cell tumors can show aggressive type of periosteal reaction. Coming to multiplicity, less than 1% of giant cell tumors can be multiple, whereas metastasis plasma cytoma and brown tumors can be multiple. The final clue is matrix. So you should always see what type of matrix the bone tumor has, whether it is a chondroid matrix or osteoid matrix. As, as far as GCT is concerned, there is no matrix mineralization. Rather, you see a lot of trabeculation giving it a so bubble appearance. So now we know that uh, we, have, we are dealing with a GCT. So it is eccentric, eccentrically located, lytic expansion lesion, which is located in the subcontral lesion, multiple trabeculation, distinct border, no matrix mineralization, and no periosteal reaction. So what else? So we have to characterize the lesion. So can we tell the lesion is benign? It is not aggressive. It is not possible by looking at the radiograph to tell whether it is the lesion is benign or malignant. Okay, the example is this lesion where the patient came in 2016, where the lesion was having a nice, clear, distinct border with, and it was well confined into the bone. When the patient came after two years, the borders became indistinct and there was further extension growth of the tumor as well as cortical disruption and soft tissue component. So by looking at the radiograph, it is difficult to tell whether the uh, lesion will go in for aggressive behavior. But when the patient is having a picture of cortical breach and soft tissue component, we can definitely tell it is a locally aggressive tumor. So once we see a locally aggressive tumor, the next we have to tell the exact extent of the lesion for surgical management. Here there is a important, here comes the role of MRI where I heavily rely on my T2 weighted images because unlike rest of the tumors, which are very much hyper intense on T2 weighted images, GCT is quite dark on T2 weighted images. This is because GCT has frequent hemorrhages, so there is a lot of hemosiderine, and also it has most of fibrocollagenous tissue. This makes GCT appear dark on T2 weighted images as compared to rest of the tumors which contain bright content. Example, the chondroid matrix in the chondroblastoma or clear cell chondrosarcomas, they are bright and chordomas are bright because of their mucinous content. So GCT tends to be darker. So here you can see a distal radial uh, GCT, where in which there is a soft tissue. Again, I'm showing T2 weighted images because it shows tumor very well. And you can see there is a posterior soft tissue extension from the distal radius. There is also involvement of the first extensor compartment and also involvement uh, abutment of the radiovascular, radial neurovascular bundles. So here I am stressing the point that I don't need to give contrast in every other patient. Only if I have doubt whether there is any involvement of neurovascular bundle, then I will give contrast. Otherwise, 
pretty much T2 weighted images and fat saturated images are sufficient to do the diagnosis and also to tell the extent of the disease. The second thing what we have to look for is ABC component which can occur up to in 40% of the cases and also for the cystic changes. So here you can see locally aggressive giant cell tumor with a soft tissue component and again I am showing you T2 weighted sequences because it shows all the features what you are looking for in a tumor. So here you can see there are multiple fluid fluid levels. These are the cystic spaces where there is sedimentation of the blood product. So you can see a bright structure wherein which there is a horizontal dark structure. So this is a fluid fluid level because of the sedimentation of the blood products. When you see this, this is an aneurysmal bone cyst. So one can ask why it is only why it is not aneurysmal bone cyst. Why you are telling that it is a giant cell tumor with aneurysmal bone component? So what I'm telling is, if you see there is a solid component which is dark on T2 along with this fluid fluid component, then that is definitely a giant cell tumor with a ABC component. This has an importance because you have to do a biopsy which involves both us uh, as well as the ABC component to get a correct diagnosis. If you do only an ABC uh, biopsy of the ABC uh, component, then you might not get a correct diagnosis. So MRA plays an important role in showing the components of the tumor and also planning the mm, biopsy. Second thing, the third thing is the pathological fractures. This is a very obvious pathological fracture, but you have to look for the subtle fractures to intimate the surgeon. There can be uncommon presentations of GCT as well. Like it can have an atypical appearance. Here you can see the tumor is rarely, it is barely seen and it, it is shown as likely a small light occlusant area. So it can have an atypical appearance as well. Then it can have an unusual manifestation in the flat bones. In up to 15% of the cases, they can appear in flat bones and also in the sesamoid bones, as in you can see in the petala here. And also they can be seen in the apophysis. When it comes to sacral, we heavily rely on the cross-sectional imaging because X-rays are not very uh, pro uh, uh, very uh hello can you hear me sir yeah yeah we are able to hear you madam yeah go ahead so one of the important differentials what we have to consider when it uh, when dealing with the sacral gct is the cordoma so what cordoma is a most closest differential what we have to consider uh, when we are dealing with uh, sacral GCT. So how to differentiate is, again, the GCTs are occur in a younger age group and they are located in the lower aspect of the sacrum and eccentric in position. And when it comes to calcification, GCTs have a peripheral axial type of calcification. And again, on T2-weighted images, they can have hypo intensities because of, again, excessive fibrocollagenous material and also hemocytin although they can also show fluid fluid levels and sacral joint involvement. When it comes to cordoma, they are mainly seen in middle age group. They are more in the central aspect. They show clumps of uh, calcification, which are fuzzy in appearance, and they're hyper intense because of the mucinous content as compared to GCT, which is hypo intense because of fibrocollagenous uh, tissues. So this is how you differentiate sacral GCTs and cordoma very easily. And up to one to 6% of the cases can have metastasis to the lung, as in this case. The most important thing is a post-operative evaluation. As uh, Dr. Sudan told that uh, the follow-up has to be done up to 10 years of age and uh, 10 years of uh, 10 years. And then the modality is the uh, multimodality imaging is very helpful in case of uh, post-operative evaluation of uh, these GCT tumors. So here you can see uh, this is the best example of good healing and without any recurrence. So this was a proximal tibial uh, GCT, which was treated with curatage and bone cementation. And you can see a nice sclerotic rim all around the lesion. So this indicates that there is a good healing without any recurrence. And this was a patient which was uh, treated by denisumab. And you can see a large expansive lytic lesion is shrink, uh, is, uh, progressively shrunken in size, and it is also showing a nice sclerotic rim around it. 
when it the when you call a recurrence you have to at least see a small rim of lucency around it it should be more than 5 mm and it should progressively increase over a time of follow up so whenever you see more than 5 mm of rim of lucency around the bone cement you should actually alert yourself for the recurrence here you can see there is a small lucency which was not uh, addressed at that time because the patient was not symptomatic but later on there uh, it progressed extensively involving the bone as well as the graft again i rely on t2 weighted images to see the exact extent within the bone as well as in the soft tissue this was another lesion which had extensive soft tissue component which was not curatized uh, adequately during the surgery and it progressively increased in size and not only the bone had a lesion sorry there was a peripheral egg calcification within the soft tissue component so when you see a soft tissue component with peripheral calcification you should always suspect there is a soft tissue recurrence here is another patient which was treated uh, with uh, curettage and bone grafting and after 5 years it was after 5 years there was a good healing on the radial side but it patient started having a lucency on the ulnar aspect so this also tells that we should follow this patient for a longer duration as long as 10 years so this patient underwent an mri and had a soft tissue component as well along with the bone component then coming to most important thing is the variants so you have an uh, lytic expansor lesion again it is more in epicenter is more in the metaphysis region and you can see there is extension through the growth plate into the subchondral region but the patient is not uh, is a skeletally immature uh, individual so this we have to consider of aneurysmal bone cysts so again mri helps in this situation where in which you don't see any solid component but you see only fluid fluid levels again as i said a rare varieties of telan uh, osteosarcoma should be considered in differential diagnosis when we see aggressive type of giant cell tumors this is an example of chondroblastoma where you see a nice epiphyseal uh, lesion lytic lesion with a sclerotic border and a ring and arc type of calcification this is easy to tell this is a chondroblastoma but if there is no uh, any uh, ring and arc uh, type of calcification there is no sclerotic border and if the epiphysis is fused mri helps in showing the chondrite type of matrix which is bright on t2 weighted images and also it shows extensive edema around the lesion suggesting that it is a chondroblastoma which is edema is not a feature of giant cell tumor and metastasis and myeloma should be considered when you see multiple lesions and also in the patient older than 50 years of age group and for the brown tumor again when you see a lost of a lot of osteoporosis which is, we should always think of giant cell tumor uh, brown tumor sorry brown tumor and you should always do serum pth to rule out hyperparathyroidism to summary always you have to go through the checklist before come to a diagnosis and access are the mainstay of uh, evaluation for the uh, this uh, for the bone tumor diagnosis so you should always see for the x ray you should uh, ask a proper history especially age of the patient and then go for the cross section to know the further extent of the lesion and also to further characterize the lesion thank you very much uh <clears throat> thank you dr pushpa that was uh, excellent a yeah, good uh, exposition of all the characters radiological characters tics of giant cell tumor and how to differentiate it from all the other giant cell variants thank you very much and now can i request you to unshare your screen and uh, dr devendra will talk to us on a very important topic how do you manage surgically when you have a tumor of the long bones and this is quite important because almost 90% to 95% of all tumors are in the long bones dr devendra has got extensive experience with it and i'll let him take over from here devendra thank you sir are you able to see my screen sir yeah yes fine thank you
thank you very much for the opportunity given today to present our work which, uh, which is done in our ganga hospital i thank uh, dr dinadalan sir dr danishekar raja and dr rajshekaran sir who have performed most of the surgeries which i am going to show in the uh, coming slides and thank you very much for the opportunity we have seen already the excellent presentations by dr raju baskar and dr pushpa about uh, how to uh, about clinical considerations as well as how to read the x ray and diagnose by x ray and now coming to the surgical treatment of uh, gen cell tumor gen cell tumor uh, by now we know that it is a benign tumor which is locally aggressive it is one of the most common musculoskeletal tumor and, and however still it is most controversial tumor and most debated tumor the coming to the surgical treatment principles there are mainly two uh, ways of uh, looking at it by principles aggressive intralesional curettage or uh, wide resection wide resection has got a recurrence rate from 0 to 16% aggressive intralesional curettage with or without a bone filler like bone allograft bone autograft or uh, application of cement have got a recurrence rate from 8.6 to 16% and this can be combined with with or without uh, adjuvant therapy also by looking at the campanacy grading uh, the uh, recurrence rate by in campanacy 1 and 2 is up to 7% and most of the 1 and 2 can be treated by curettage uh, uh, treatment most of them are amenable for simple curettage however in campanacy 3 grade which has got a recurrence rate of up to 29% uh, they have got a high recurrence rate and requires uh, the wide resection of the tumor and when we perform surgeries in recurrent lesions the recurrence rate again goes up to 34% and adjuvant therapy is most of the uh, is might be required in most of these patients when we look at the adjuvants that are available now for the treatment the phenol nitrogen peroxide organ beam coagulation cryo surgery alcohol and cement they are the frequently used uh, adjuvants after intra uh, lesional curettage however their additional value continues to be debated the evidence says that extensive intra lesional curettage followed by high speed burring and filling up the defect by uh, using either bone cement or uh, allograft will uh, mostly reduces the recurrence rate and there is a limited limited role for other oncologic adjuvants when uh, apart from cement coming to the important steps how to do intra lesional curettage first we need to have adequate exposure of the lesion followed by large cortical window to access the tumor from uh, all uh, corners of the tumor and multiple angled uh, curettes are required uh, which helps us to identify the small small pockets in the corners and access them and high power burr is very important to break the bony ridges here is a 26 years old female patient who had uh, proximal tibia gene cell tumor confirmed by biopsy and uh, we planned for uh, intralesional curettage here adequate exposure was by, uh, done by anterolateral approach and then cortical window was made uh, by about 5 to 5 cm and then adequate uh, access was gained for the tumor and after curettage we did a uh, extended curettage by using high speed burr Uh, all the pockets were uh, completely accessed and then bony ridges were broken and here the high speed burring it helps in uh, it helps the in decreasing the recurrence rate by causing thermal effect which uh, in turn causes additional removal of 1 mm of uh, the margin and helps in uh, decreasing the recurrence rate once we do uh, adequate clearance of the uh, tumor and then do burring we are left over with a large bony defect and here the tumor appears to be extending up to the articular cartilage which uh, with the thin dot margins however the medial bone is um, weight bearing bone is intact so here we can think of uh, salvaging this proximal tu uh, tumor proximal tibia tumor here if you place a, uh, for the to fill the defect we can use a cement or allograft Uh, since considering the uh, size of the defect which is huge we can combine the allograft along with cement and if you place a cement throughout the defect up to the articular cartilage there is a possibility of destructing the cartilage and then uh, 
chance of arthritis are present. Hence, we can use a subchondral uh, bone graft. And in our institution, we have a bone bank and we take uh, cancerous bone grafts, uh, which are processed and gamma rated allografts, which are placed underneath the cartilage for, uh, for uh, three to four uh, uh, millimeters, and then uh, place the cement so that uh, uh, thermal necrosis of the articular cartilage doesn't happen. We can use either autografts or allografts. In our institution, we have uh, allografts available, so we use allograft. The first picture shows complete placement of the allograft underneath the articular cartilage, followed by cement placement uh, well below the articular cartilage so that it won't cause any thermal necrosis of the cartilage. This is called a sandwich technique. And in, in the post-op X-ray also, we can visualize that the cement is well below the articular margin. The bone cement, it provides local adjuvant therapy and immediate stability. When there is a lodge defect, it acts as a, it gives immediate stability. And when we look at the X-ray in the follow-up to look for uh, any recurrence, the, if, we, if we have used a cement, it presents the ideal, ideal radiological features to easily identify the local recurrences. It reduces the local recurrence by mainly by thermal necrosis and then its toxic effects. Here is a 38 years, uh, eight years old gentleman uh, with this uh, Campana C1 uh, distal femur uh, giant cell tumor confirmed by biopsy. And it was uh, treated by only cement. However, it is well above the articular margin. Hence, we chose only to pack with uh, cement. And even after five years, we could see that there is no recurrence and patient is doing well without any problems. And there are no signs of any arthritis. The post-operative post protocol, if we have used, if we have done only curettage, we can make the patient wait, uh, walk with non-weight bearing. And if we have used uh, cement, we can weight bearing, uh, we can start weight bearing immediately. And follow up, as Dr. Raju Bhaskar told, we need to follow up is very important to identify the recurrence in the follow up uh, in the coming period. When we use cement alone, there is a high rate of uh, joint arthritis, which is proven in the literature, which is reported in the literature also. Intralesional curettage followed by only allograft also can be used, need not be combined all the time with cement. And here, a 18 years old boy with uh, the giant cell tumor of the distal radius confirmed by biopsy. Uh, and the tumor is extending up to the uh, physis. And this was completely curated and uh, allograft alone was used. And patient had a very good outcome. Even after five years, there was no recurrence and uh, it is completely healed. Wide apart from intralesional curettage, wide resection is one more option for uh, tumor. And wide resection, the survival rates are very encouraging. The morbidity and mortality are very negligible. Reconstruction of the defect is quite challenging after uh, wide resection of the tumor. The reconstruction after wide excision of the tumor, when we are salvaging the uh, limb, uh, there are various options available. If the tumor is in the proximal tibia, we can excise the whole tumor by end, uh, completely the whole proximal tibia can be excised. Uh, and then we can do a ternoplasty where the distal femur can be made in, the anterior half of the distal femur can be made into uh, half, two halves, and then turn it, which is called as a ternoplasty, and then we can do arthrodesis. If the tumor is in the distal radius, where we do in, when we do n-block resection, instead of using a, a ipsilateral fibula, which has got high morbidity and then a, a, a corporal dislocation chances and then a, a wrist problems, the ulnar translocation and wrist arthrodesis can be done in distal radius problems. And tumor process can be used in situations where distal femur, proximal tibia, and proximal humerus are involved involved. And amputation, when the lesion is quite extensive, not able to salvage the limb, uh, we can do amputation, which is also a form of uh, 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 preventing recurrence. Here is a 33 years old gentleman with extensive osteolytic lesion, which is proven by biopsy as a giant cell tumor. It is quite aggressive tumor. CT scan shows very limited bone stock, expanse shell, and also the cortices are quite thinned out. In this situation, we can do a ternoplasty like this, where the proximal tibial lesion was completely uh, removed, end block resection was done, followed by ternoplasty, and then uh, nail arthrodesis was done, and it is done uh, five years ago, and there was no signs of recurrence so far. 
here is a uh, 40 years old gentleman with uh, aggressive distal uh, distal radius tumor which is proven by biopsy as gene cell tumor here if you look the distal radius is completely eroded the margins are thinned out and then cortical break is seen and also there is a soft tissue ext extension in the mri in, in uh, the various options are available to reconstruct uh, this kind of uh, tumors once we remove complete whole distal radius we can use ipsilateral fibula or allograft distal radius or translocation of the uh, wrist and uh, one bone forearm reconstruction between ulna to wrist the, we did in, in uh, after excision of the tumor we did a translocation and then wrist arthrodesis was performed and uh, it, there was no recurrence till 10 years uh, so far and recently patient presented with a perimplant fracture following a trauma however the wrist was completely normal no signs of any recurrence and he was treated by an additional plate and he had a good outcome as well and this technique of ulnar translocation and wrist arthrodesis for uh, campanasi grade 3 joint cell tumor of the distal radius it is reported by dr ajay puri and team from tata memorial hospital and they report and they have reported a very good outcome uh, with this technique coming to the tumor processes in situations where the tumor is located quite uh, close to the joints and uh, which is not uh, possible to reconstruct in campanasi 3 grades and when there is a bone stock is very less, uh, we can do end block resection of the whole joint and then we can perform a tumor, uh, a replacement surgery by putting a, by a tumor process. Here is a 30 years old female where the extensive osteolytic lesion involving more than uh, two thirds of the distal femur and primarily itself, uh, we did a, a tumor processes after end block resection and the patient had a quite uh, good outcome without any recurrence so far. Here is a patient with the proximal tibia joint cell tumor, which is collapsed into varus, thinned out articular margins, and three-fourths of the proximal tibia is completely uh, eroded, and uh, cortical breach, breach is seen. And in MRI, there is extens uh, it is extended into the posterior tissues as well. In these situations, it is not possible to do only curatage and bone grafting, and it is quite uh, difficult to reconstruct. So in this patient, we did an envelope resection and then a tumor process was used and patient had a good outcome without any recurrence so far. Here is a 50 years old female, proximal humerus joint cell tumor confirmed by biopsy. And it looks quite uh, huge and eroded. Here uh, the MRI shows uh, involvement of the cuff as well. In this patient, after complete uh, excision of the proximal uh, humerus tumor, we, uh, the cuff also was completely was removed. So in this situation, uh, we can see the first picture that uh, cuff also is uh, removed, most of the cuff. And in this situation, when there is no cuff and uh, we can, uh, the instead of doing only uh, hemiarthroplasty, we can do total hip, total shoulder arthroplasty by doing a reverse shoulder, which has, uh, which has got a good function. And this patient went on to have a very good result uh, no signs of any uh, recurrence so far. And uh, patient has got a uh, very satisfactory movements, uh, significant improvement uh, in forward elevation, even though there is partial loss of flexional rotation. Now having seen the technique of intralational curatage and then uh, cementing and with sandwich techniques and then uh, wide resection and uh, primarily uh, doing joint replacements and salvage of the uh, limb by thermoplasty, let us see how to treat a recurrent lesion also. Here is a patient with a 37 years old male, distal femur, uh, joint cell tumor, and the medial, mainly involving the medial femoral condyle. Biopsy showed uh, joint cell tumor, and it, it was quite uh, extensive. And patient presented four months after the biopsy, and it shows increase in size of the tumor. Uh, MRI also shows there is increase in the size of the tumor. This is the clinical picture uh, showing the involvement of the medial femoral condyle. Completely, it was curated, and then uh, burring was done, and thorough uh, curatage and high-speed burring. And then uh, we, we tried to uh, give a chance by giving uh, by trying a sandwich technique in this patient. Initially, allograft was placed underneath the cartilage, articular cartilage so that uh, the application of cement doesn't cause any arthritis to the femoral, uh, femoral articular cartilage. And uh, 
this is the post operative x ray showing uh, well uh, curated and then uh, packed with cement however uh, and it was confirmed as a gct following uh, curatives and however patient uh, came back within a year duration with a recurrence of the same tumor and it was confirmed by mri and the whole tumor was completely excised and then uh, uh, the tumor process was placed and with a long stem and uh, this is the final post operative x ray showing good position of the implants and the whole specimen was sent for biopsy and showed the margins were clear completely and there are no signs of any recurrence so far here is a patient with a distal tibial uh, joint cell tumor which was initially treated with curatives and uh, cement alone and presented with recurrence within uh, two years duration elsewhere treated initially and then advised for amputation and uh, by looking at the x-ray we can we notice that the whole articular cartilage is involved and the whole distal tibia is involved in this situation uh, the calculated defect after excision of the distal tibia was around 8 cm we decided to salvage without doing any amputation in this patient the removal of the whole tumor after thorough dissection and then uh, the whole the similar sized allograft was used to uh, to plas to match correctly the dome of the talus and then retrograde nail arthrodesis was performed here the, the technique was very important throughout the length of the allograft uh, inside the medullary canal the ilac cris grafts were placed so that the healing happens between the allograft and post bone proximally and distally and in this patient we uh, by 2 years it was completely com completely healed without any problem and uh, so far uh, 10 years since the surgery and there are no signs of any recurrence apart from this kind of salvage techniques amputation also needs to be performed in few patients with recurrence of the lesions uh, superadded by infections where the, uh, where it is difficult to reconstruct or salvage the limb uh, this is a patient a 40 years old gentleman uh, with a proximal tibial gct which was uh, the uh, ct scan shows completely thinned out cartilages and then posterior extension also is seen and the biopsy confirmed it as joint cell tumor initially uh, curatage and uh, uh, attempt was made to salvage the proximal tibia by putting by doing a sandwich technique however uh, this patient went on to this is uh, immediate post op x ray however the patient went on to have recurrence within one year duration and in this situation where the the proximal tibia cannot be salvaged uh, amputation is also best choice to save the life of the, limb, the life of the patient also here is a 25 years old uh, lady who presented with distal tibial uh, joint cell tumor which was initially curated by us and used allografts and ilacris grafts combined however uh, patient presented within 3 months time with a recurrence and uh, followed by uh, we treated by uh, distal tibial allograft and the complete end block resection of the tumor was performed however patient showed recurrence within 9 months period and hence uh, we did a bilone amputation in this patient so to conclude joint cell tumor the treatment of joint cell tumor is remains controversial still uh, the important steps are adequate curatage filling the filling up the defect by using uh, uh, either bone cement or sandwich technique by using allografts and autografts and adjuvant therapy is very important uh, what is important is uh, adequate clearance of the disease either by doing uh, intralesional curatage or by complete excision of the tumor the challenge lies in the treatment of benign tumors is by balancing satisfactory recurrence rates with acceptable surgical morbidity thank you sir thank you david really excellent thank i you, mean you show very uh, illustrative cases for the surgical principles that we follow thank you very much for doing that and can you unshare your screen so that yes, i can <clears throat> so all the previous speakers uh, very clearly showed uh, the principles of uh, treatment of giant cell tumor now would over the next 15 minutes talk about uh, giant cell tumors of the spine what is most important to understand is that giant cell tumor itself is a rare tumor 
and in the spine, it is still rarer. So we are talking about a tumor which is just 0.04% of all the bone tumors that occurs. But even though it is rare, it is one of the causes for a lot of morbidity and mortality if it is not actually treated properly. So I will just talk of some principles that we need to follow whenever we see a tumor. The first principle is we need to know that it is the same tumor like what occurs in the long bones, that it is benign, but can be very locally aggressive and sometimes metastasize also. So the principles of treatment are the same, but the challenges actually become more difficult and much different because of the exotic location. Now, this is what is any king's principle. So when you have a tumor like this, if you want to do an intralesional tumor, then you do an end block excision within the tumor. Now that is the maximum that you can do when you're talking about the spine. If you are talking about a radicular end block excision, then you have to excise the whole compartment and that is possible in a long bone. But if you talk about, see for example, here you are seeing a giant cell tumor that was filled with uh, cement, but you can see that there is a local recurrence and then it is possible for you to completely radically excise it and then put in a prosthesis. But how do you do the same when there is a tumor in the spine? You can see the triglyceride, all the other compartments. And when you need to do a radical excision, you're actually talking about a tumor which has actually occupied the epidural space and also infiltrated the dura and many of the vessels. And it's not practically possible for you to do a radical excision. So the first principle is that we have to realize that the first surgery is the best surgery. And there is rarely a need for hurried or unplanned surgeries. Everything you do in the first surgery, you have to plan and execute it to perfection so that you get the best results possible. Now, you also need to know that the surgeon is not the most important part of the whole treatment. If you look at the management, it is actually multidisciplinary. You need to arrive at a good diagnosis. You need to stage the tumor. You need to have a perfect tissue diagnosis. You need help from the radiologist for preoperative embolization. Sometimes adjuvant therapy is required. And you see, you have a lot of things to do before you can go on to excise and reconstruct. So surgery is an important, but a small step in the overall management. And sooner a surgeon realizes this, it's good for his patient. The second important thing is there is no clinical or radiological feature that is exclusively diagnostic of GCT or judge about its clinical behavior. This is very important. So if you look at the clinical presentation, uh, Dr. Raj Bhaskar actually enumerated all the presentations, but you will see that they are very vague. It is not very specific. It's low back pain, it's localized tenderness, it is reduced movements, and you can also present with a neurological deficit at a later stage but it's no different from other lesions. Now, this actually illustrates uh, very well. Now, this 54-year-old patient had a lot of pain in the neck and he was diagnosed to have a lesion in the cervical spine. This is a late MRI, but the initial MRI showed a small lesion. And because he also had a pulmonary tuberculosis at the same time, it was thought to be a spinal tuberculosis. They did not go in for correct treatment and then he presented to us with quadriplegia. So never assume anything unless you do a biopsy. You need to be very careful about it. The radiological features also is not very specific. Now you can have a lot of cystic lesions like this. You can have a pathological fracture. You can have a compression of the bone and you can have things which are very, very typical and common to other lesions and there is nothing specific about a GCT in the radiological feature, especially in the spine. Also don't rely on X-rays because it is a poor and late indicator. 
if you are talking about a symptomatology or a presentation at the cervicothoracic junction or in the sacrum, you will find that you are not able to diagnose this tumor till very late. Now, this patient, you can see that there is almost a translation of the spine. And this was not diagnosed because the higher level of imaging was delayed. This is the same. You can see that there is a sacral lesion here, not diagnosed for a long time. But when you take a CT and MRI, you can see that the horse has run out of the stable for too long a period of time. And what should have happened is that you should have done an imaging much earlier. Another case over here, a patient with low back pain, just neglected for higher imaging. And when the patient had the imaging after eight months, you can see that the lesion had become too large. Now, the fourth principle is diagnosis and prognosis depends on histology and staging. So you need to have a good histology. That's fundamental. However much clinically or radiologically it is suggestive of a giant cell tumor, it is a giant cell tumor only when it is histologically proved. You don't do a fine needle aspiration uh, biopsy for this. It always has to be a core tissue biopsy. So use a J needle and you need to have a three or four passes, get good cores from uh, the right uh, site and then you will make a good diagnosis. So the histology in a giant cell tumor is usually there are three cell types the multinuclear giant cell, the spindle cells, and the round cells. Now, although it is called the giant cell, the prognosis doesn't come according to the large multinucleated giant cells, which are reactive. It is actually the smaller stromal cells and the behavior and the characteristics that they see under the histopathology, which actually gives us a clue whether it is neoplastic or not. Now, once you diagnose a giant cell, what are the options available? Now, as Devendra said, for long bones, the same principles apply for the spine. The best results come out of surgical clearance, and the prognosis depends upon how good your surgical clearance has been. Radio, radiotherapy has only a very limited uh, application. Now, this meta-analysis very clearly shows uh, the fact now, if you look at 239 spinal lesions which were studied, you can see that the recurrence rates with radiation therapy alone is 49%. That means every alternate case is going to break up. Now, if you do an interlesional surgery, it's not much better, 47%. And if you do an intralesional excision with radiation therapy, not much better at all, 46%. If you need to do a good job, it has to be a surgery with wide margins. And to do that in the spine is a surgical challenge. And you also need to be uh, sure of the other fact that radiation ensued sarcoma, it develops in 11% of patient when you're not completely excised and you subject a patient to radiotherapy. So if you have to do a good surgical job, you need to do an accurate localization and also staging of the disease. So you always look at curative therapy. And if you have to do a curative therapy, you need to understand the terminologies. Now, if you have a lesion like this, this is called intralesional. <clears throat> you go in and you take some bit of the bone, but it is not complete. Marginal is when you go up to the margins and little beyond into the normal tissue, this is wide excision. But if you need to do a radical excision, that means this we sometimes do in sacral tumors where we sacrifice even the dura and the nerve roots for giving benefit of a complete radical excision. In rest of the fine, it is usually a wide end block excision outside the pseudocapsule. To do this, you definitely need to have a preoperative embolization. There is a very good report from the Mayo Hospital, where in about in the initial, in the 1980s, before embolization was very common, 18 of 96 patients actually died in the perioperative or on the table because of severe bleeding. So if you have a lesion like this, with such a prominent tumor blush, 
it's a very dangerous thing to do a surgery. You need to embolize. And when you see a picture like this, and if you're going to operate on this patient the next day, your mind is at rest. Another sacral lesion, you can see there is such a prominent tumor blush. You can see a lot of tumor vessels. And when you have actually completely embolized, it makes your surgery much safer and better. How do you decide what kind of surgery do you do? And for that, we utilize the WBB classification, where on a transverse section of the spine, it is divided into 12 quadrants like that of the face of a clock. Now, if only the posterior uh, structures are involved, then a posterior resection is enough. Whereas if it crosses the midline, then you need a sagittal resection. And if it is in the front or if it comes behind, you either do a vertebral body resection or most prominently, you can also do a complete vertebral excision. Now, posterior resection alone for a giant cell tumor is very rare because this location itself is very rare. But here you can find one patient where the vertebral body is normal. All that is involved is the posterior line. So that allowed us to actually go and do just a posterior resection. And this is the uh, postoperative lesion that you see. Mostly, almost always, you will find that the giant cell tumor involves the body and also involves the pedicle, either on both sides or on one side, which makes it uh, mandatory to have a vertebral body resection. Now, there are two approaches to do a vertebral body resection. I'll just go into the principles, not going into the details. That which was proposed by Tomita, where you do an end block resection, everything from the posterior side is most ideal, but most challenging. So most of the people would now do a combined extra and intra lesional excision of the tumor in two stages. From the posterior side, you excise all that you need to excise from the posterior side and also a large part of the pedicles. And then you also do a posterior fixation. And then either on the same day or immediately on a second stage, you can go and do a complete vertebral uh, excision from the anterior side. Now, this is one of our favorite approach because if you look here, this is the total end block spondylectomy, which was published by Tomita, which made him very famous in 1994. But if you, this is the way that you do it. You are gone on the posterior side, you excise all the posterior structures, and then you do a costovertebrectomy approach on either side, and then you disconnect the vertebral bone, and right from the posterior side, you deliver the whole of this board. Now, this is a slide from uh, Boriani, and you can see that uh, everything is done from the posterior side. But if you look at the blood loss, you will find that many of these patients have a blood loss of more than five liters up to even 13 liters. Now, that is a serious risk, especially in our setup. So what we do is a two-stage approach where in the first stage, you can see here that we have gone and completely excised the posterior structures. Between the nerve roots, we also remove the pedicles fully on both sides. So whatever is left behind is only that part of the body, which we can go anteriorly. And once the body is removed, we reconstruct it using a titanium cage filled with bone grafts or aloe grafts or a rib graft. And then you can find that the whole vertebrectomy has been done and is also very well uh, reconstructed. Now, this is a patient whom we uh, did about 14 years ago, and he is completely normal. Another example for a two-staged approach, you can see that there is a typical uh, giant cell tumor over here, uh, typical radiology and typical MRI pictures. CT shows that there is a complete destruction and the bone has started collapsing and the same approach was performed. So this actually gives a very, very good uh, results for us, very predictable, very safe and uh, without much blood loss. But 
what actually makes a giant cell tumor difficult for surgery is when it uh, occurs in junctional lesions. For example, if it happens at the L5. So you can see here, there is a, in 2013, there is a lesion in uh, L5. This patient came to us referred for a disc prolapse because of low back pain, but actually radiology just showed uh, that it is a tumor. He had actually had uh, surgery outside and he came back with uh, recurrence. And you can see that there is a good progress of the tumor by then. And uh, we just fixed on the first stage. You can see that there is a spinopelvic fixation because we have to excise the entire L5. And once this was done through a financial approach, we went in completely excised L5 and also reconstructed it with an expanding cage. Now this patient had uh, embolization and uh, he had a very good result. This was his first year post-operative picture, but you can see after six years follow-up, everything is good. The CT scan shows a complete uh, healing, no recurrence, and this is him after uh, six years. Another place where you can have a challenge by the location is this patient who had a giant cell at C2 and uh, C3. Now, impossible to approach this through transoral because it is below C2. And it is also not possible to go via the neck because it's much higher up to C2. The only way that you can have a good excision is to do by opening the mandible as a book. So you can see that we are going through the midline. In this approach, you actually split the lower lip and the chin, and then you do an osteotomy of the mandible. You can see that the mandible is being opened up like a book. And after that, you actually cut the tongue into two. The tongue is uh, separated. And uh, you can see over here that once the tongue is separated into two, you have an absolute approach on the soft palate. You can even dissect the soft palate if you want more approach. But in this case, it was not necessary. The entire retropharynx is completely on your vision. And then it is possible for you to completely excise the tumor and then reconstruct it with an expanding cage. And this is the actual uh, reconstruction of this. Now, this patient had a symptom-free uh, <clears throat> period for a few years, after which he had a recurrence. And then uh, after a few years, he actually died. But you can see the reconstruction is back again. You can see that the tongue is being sutured back and then the mandible is plated back. And this is him, and this was his uh, four-year follow-up after which he uh, developed a recurrence. So to end and conclude, I would come back to this slide, which I think is the most important slide of the whole presentation. That a surgeon should know that a giant cell tumor in the spine is the same tumor which can be very aggressive. And it is the same principle that surgery is an important, but a small step in the overall management. You need to depend on your friends, your radiology friends, your pathology friends, and also your oncology person. Because diagnosis, staging, tissue diagnosis, preoperative embolization, your correct uh, what you need to do for your adjuvant therapy and how do you follow up. All this actually comes into how good you can do for this patient. So thank you very much because uh, this is a very exotic uh, tumor which is occurring in an exotic place when you talk of spinal GCT. Thank you very much. So I would next uh, request our oncologist uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar to give his talk on medical management of GCD. Nothing much has happened on the surgical field except using of navigation and other things which makes surgery much safer. But there has been a dramatic uh, change in the medical management of uh, GCT, especially with denosumab. And uh, I'm sure that people are listening to this talk 
very, very carefully and with a lot of interest. So Sunil, can you please tell us about medical management? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, very uh, good evening to one and all. So I'll be speaking on medical management of GCT. So the mainstay of treatment is surgery. So I don't want uh, any uh, bad ideas to be taken that Dinozumab can compensate for a bad surgery. After, after an, a very extensive talk by Dr. Raj Sagar and Dr. Devendra on uh, beautiful surgeries, I'll be enumerating exactly where uh, Dinozumab plays a role uh, in these patients. So indication for uh, uh, drug therapy is an unresectable disease if a patient is supposedly unfit for surgery and in overall GCT, only 15 to 20 percent of these patients will need a neoadjuvant denosumab that too to facilitate curate, curatage or convert a resection into a curatable lesion or to facilitate a resection. I'll give you examples for each of these and the role of uh, uh, denosumab as adjuvant after resection or after complete curatage is uh, not known. So what is converting a resectable uh, lesion to a curatage is uh, when you see such a lesion uh, which uh, the almost all three walls of the distal tibia is gone and in such a case we might need to use something as an ear driven setting either to do a good resection or to convert a resectable lesion into a curatage. So what is facilitating a resection? And when you think of such a lesion, when uh, the lesion in the proximal tibia uh, involving both the anterior and the posterior compartment, encasing all the neurovascular bundles and causing uh, a but, uh, encasement of the fibula, we can be using denosumab in such a patient to facilitate resection and to assess response later. So what are the options uh, of uh, treatment? Initially, when, before dinosubab came into play, that is a targeted therapy came into play, the, what was being tried were radiotherapy, uh, which had converted what is called a so-called a benign lesion. And there had been a lot of malignant transformation of a benign GCT. So the radiotherapy has fallen out of flavor. Next comes cis pattern based chemotherapy. Again, in a benign lesion, the response rates are extremely low. Chemoembolization has also been used extensively before uh, surgery and the response duration has always been uh, transient. Bone modifying agents have been tried uh, like zolindronic acid uh, before uh, the advent of denosumab. So as we all know, denosumab acts is a targeted therapy, it specifically targets the rank ligand, uh, the mechanism of action which I will come into uh, later. Uh, it is FDA approved in 2013, initially started for treatment of osteoporosis. Now it has been extensively used in osteoporosis, GCT, metastatic bone tumors uh, like breast, prostate cancer and uh, many others and multiple myeloma. So uh, you can see this one, uh, the pink one is the tumor. So it stimulates the osteostromal uh, cells uh, that, uh, and the osteoblast uh, to produce the rank ligand, which in turn stimulates the osteoclast to produce the giant cells. So what happens to, uh, what the denosumab does is inhibits these rank ligand and prevents proliferation of both stromal cells and osteoclast. So in turn, reducing, uh, uh, so when you take a re uh, resection, resected specimen of a GCT and analyze in the pathology lab after treatment of denosumab, it shows that it can eliminate up to 80 to 90% of giant cells and reduction in stromal cell density. And there is increased newborn formation in places where stromal cells were positive for rank ligand. But you should note that there are three components of uh, a giant cell tumor. One is the giant cells and the stromal cells. And third one is the tumor. That, that, there is no tumoricidal effect uh, by denosumab. So if, when we look, uh, look at a lesion like this, when do we, how do we decide on giving a denosumab? So what do we do uh, before uh, starting denosumab, uh, denosumab for a patient? So mandatory things that, uh, that has to be done are looking at the serum calcium value because there can be hypo or hypercalcemia in these patients, which has to be corrected. Second is a phosphate value because denosumab can cause hypophosphatemia and anemia. The second most important thing is 
doing a dental evaluation for all these patients uh, because uh, if a patient has uh, infected tooth or a dental caries or uh, recently undergone any dental treatment the denosumab has to be delayed or uh, started late because it can cause osteoradionecrosis of jaw suppose if the patient has undergone a recent uh, dental procedure then denosumab should be delayed up uh, at least 8 weeks and it is safer between 8 to 12 weeks to prevent uh, late complications like that or osteoradionecrosis uh, of jaw so what is the dose that the denosumab should be started the denosumab should be started at a dose of 120 mg subcutaneously on day 1 day 8 and day 15 that is weekly doses the first three doses will be weekly then it will be every month uh, and calcium and vitamin sub vitamin d supplements also are started along with denosumab neoadjuvant treatment so how long should this uh, treatment should go on if you are thinking in terms of neoadjuvant treatment you should assess the patient peri- periodically and the treatment terminates once the necessary response is achieved that is you think if you are giving it for uh, conver- converting unresectable lesion to a resectable lesion then once you think you have achieved your goal the neoadjuvant treatment should stop which is usually between 3 to 3 to 6 months of treatment in metastatic setting we usually treat until progression or patient can be off treatment once the patient has become asymptomatic or and it can be restarted once there is progression of symptoms there is no phase 3 evidence for uh, doing either of this but is that is this is what is done in real time so based on various studies the usual treatment of denosumab has been varied between somewhere between 16 to 15 months 6 to 15 months how do we assess response once we have started denosumab we know how long to give how do we assess response it can be either clinical or radiographic response clinical response in terms of pain the patient patient uh, pain score has uh, come down whether the swelling size has come down if it is around the wrist joint whether the wrist movements are, or if it is around the knee joint whether the knee joint movement is better or if it is in the ankle joint whether the movement is better so ability to bear uh, uh, weight bear is also another uh, example that patient has responded well if the patient has any skin changes because of stretching skin or discharging sinuses and we can assess the response by assessing whether it has healed better or not so how do we radi- radiologically assess response it's usually done between 6 to 8 weeks that is after usually after two doses so after every two doses we need to assess a response what do we find in them there is an ossified rim and there is a reduction in soft tissue component improvement in the subchondral bone thickness and there is increased ossification in the lesion so if once this response assessment is done we know in the neoadjuvant setting if we have reached uh, achieved our goal we should stop treatment why do we stop treatment because uh, of the uh, we don't know the long term effects and what are the adverse effects of denosumab the hypophosphatemia can happen there can be back pain or generalized body pain anemia hypo or hypercalcemia either of this can happen osteonecrosis of jaw this usually happens when the patient has dental caries or some form of dental infection and usually at a, approximately at one year of treatment this is why we need to reduce the treatment duration what is the dread side effect or probably a missed biopsy because uh, as uh, we know giant cell can be seen in lot of other uh, lesions this can be either a dreaded complication or a missed biopsy long term treatment of denosumab can cause a high grade sarcoma can even cause sometimes a high grade osteosarcoma this has been reported in literature and uh, there are have been 11 cases across various studies so what is the recurrent rate is there any redu- reduction in recurrence rate after when you pre treat with denosumab or it's just only the conversion there has been a systematic review and a meta analysis looked at this and they have clearly very clearly said that there is no difference in recurrence rate whether you have treated with denosumab or have gone with upfront resection is just the conversion rate of a resection to a quick cure or a uh, unresectable lesion to a resectable lesion that has changed so denosumab per se has not reduced uh, much of a recurrence rate what can be the cause of 
these recurrence rate to be same even after there is a clinical or a radiological response do you know as we know denosumab acts only on osteoclastic giant cells and the stroma cells it is not a tumoricidal there can be tumor cells that get embedded in the new bone and the fibrous ossification that happens with the treatment of denosumab can result in a difficult denialization of the extent of tumor so suppose if we start a denosumab and the lesion is not responding the first differential diagnosis should be a giant cell rich uh, 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 non gct tumor like osteosarcoma sts or a malignant fibrous osteocytoma so a need a, a repeat biopsy has to be done which has to be definitely guided so what is the evidence we have spoken so much about the duration of treatment what evidence are we speaking on so it is all phase 1 bar phase 2 trials but the response rates have been excellent do you have an indian evidence yes there had been a paper from tata memorial hospital which uh, show which is a prospective data which is not uh, which is of a 44 patients where they have had good response what is ongoing is the uh, japanese study jcog 1610 which is a phase 3 study which has started in october which results are expected in 2021 and this uh, they have trying to evaluate the superiority of denosumab the prime end, end point is being the relapse free survival actually i have spoken the radiotherapy in a benign lesion which can chance of benign tumor into high grade malignant tumor it has fallen out of favor but what's new in radiotherapy or as we all know the denosumab acts only on giant cells and stromal cells it leaves behind residual tumor cells they have been evaluating is there a role for radiotherapy in post treatment after denosumab to uh, radiate those tumor cells the results uh, the studies uh, this uh, concept is new and they are evaluating this so pre uh, uh, phase of denosumab where bisphosphonate were used uh, but this trials have come to early closure these were all phase 2 trials which came to early closure because denosumab showed a very good response so this are all retrospective and phase 2 trials and the only role for bisphosphonate in indian setting would be a non affordable patient and but the problems of iv uh, nature of this drugs and the oral bisphosphonates have not been evaluated in this setting at all so coming to metastatic gct the treatment is still surgery in a resectable stage we would like to go ahead with surgery because surgery gives a complete cure in some uh, uh, metastatic lesions even we can observe the, those lesions for 2 uh, to 3 months and see if there is rapid progression and only uh, surgery is indicated on all uh, resectable cases wax has revolutionized this treatment of lung metastasis not only in gct and across wide ranges of other bone and sarcoma tumors denosumab is only used in unresectable metastatic uh, disease and duration of treatment is still not known chemotherapy response rates are around 2% so i would like to not confuse you i would like to answer some straight forward questions uh, and treatment of uh, uh, using of this targeted agent the indication for denosumab remains only in metastatic neoadjuvant unresectable or unfit patients all of this surgery becomes the mainstay of treatment the dose is 120 mg subcutaneous 3 weekly then monthly in case of neoadjuvant setting until your target is achieved you can treat and in and uh, in uh, metastatic setting until progression or patient is symptomatically better so usually this preoperative denosumab uh the conversion happens within 3 to 6 months but there are no phase 3 studies continuation of denosumab post operatively uh, should be continued post operatively that is don't defer it to roll but people have used across various studies up to 6 doses either monthly or 3 monthly interval any role for adjuvant denosumab after resection there is no role recurrence rate after denosumab same as in primary setting if not continued post operatively so long term effects of denosumab are i known there are reports of high grade sarcoma so it has to be used judiciously so what is awaited is the desio the phase 3 trial which will bring us a lot of light thank you <clears throat> thank you
Thank you, Sunil. Uh, that was excellent. I think uh, this was a very good. Uh, this was a very good session where uh, I think every aspect of um, giant cell tumors has been very nicely covered, starting with the clinical aspects, radiological considerations, surgical principles, and also the hot topic in giant cell tumor that is the denosumab and uh, pharmacological uh, intervention. So we have a few questions uh, over here. So I will address uh, one by one to all of you. So regarding the uh, clinical presentation, people have been asking about uh, how do you treat multicentric uh, presentations, number one, and second, does recurrence means malignant transformation? So these are the two questions. Uh, Dr. Raja Baskar, can you uh, answer this? Does multicentric giant cell presentation mean that it is more aggressive? And secondly, when a giant cell tumor recurs, does it mean that it has already become malignant? You are muted, so you can unmute. Yeah. So, so to answer both those questions, first of all, there is a 5% chance of polyoso presentation-wise, there is monoostotic and polyostotic. 5%, 3 to 5% always giant cell tumors have a polyostotic presentation. There is no evidence to show that if you have a polyostotic presentation, the tumor is more aggressive. It is just that due to the genes which are affecting there and due to the variability in presentation. So to get that point clear, polyostotic is a 5% chance and that does not increase the aggressiveness of the disease. The second option, the, the second question which was asked, does recurrence mean it is a um, uh, malignant disease? Completely no. The biggest causes of recurrence are even in a mild GCT, even with a, for example, a Jaffe's type 1. Suppose you do incomplete curatage, there will be a recurrence. And so recurrence does not mean there are various different factors which are affecting recurrence. So in fact, as already told by uh, even Dr. Devendra and Dr. Sunil, surgery is the most important cause. So when the, the few cases which were denosumab, which they showed that there was an increased recurrence because denosumab, it goes and gives because of these early sclerosis, which happens. And it all, even during the surgery, the visual field of the surgeon, sometimes these stromal cells, which are notorious for causing these recurrence, they get completely covered. And so it is when you're doing the burning, you're not able to completely go and access those cells. So recurrence is a lot related to the adequacy of disease clearance exactly. And recurrence does not mean that there is aggressive. Of course, you should also forget that if there is aggressive, there is a recurrence, you should again check the histology and see if it is the 1% of dying cell which goes into a malignant variety, is that one you're missing? But recurrence is directly not related to malignant transformation of GCT. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, two more questions. Uh, you mentioned about five principles of biopsy of giant cell tumors. So can you quickly uh, enumerate them before you ask, go on to the next one? Yeah. No, the principles of biopsy are the same actually for, uh, for all the tumor cases, which I can elaborate. One is the biopsy has to be done by the same surgeon who is going to be doing the final procedure and it's also going to be done in the same center. Second one is you have to go to the easiest accessible route and then you have to go, you should not contaminate, you should go only through one muscle structure and you should not contaminate the, and you should make sure you're away from the neurovascular bundle. And also always you have to take the uh, biopsy in line with the scars, which is going to be, and so that you it will facilitate and your final surgery will involve excision of the entire uh, biopsy. And one more important thing with this histology, which they are very particular, especially in the West, is the histology slides which are taken has to be, the same slides has to be reviewed by another pathologist cannot be that you take three samples and give three different samples to different pathologists. They report on different ones. It doesn't mean that there is a variability. The same slides which are taken are to be sent to everyone. With regards to 
giant cell, as I said, because there is, it is not a salvage option. You are thinking it's an intralesional surgery and you are looking at reconstructive options like plating and uh, osteosynthesis. Whichever options, like for example, in the pelvic, if you're going, if you're going to go, you have to go through an ilioinguinal. Suppose there is a huge uh, sacral pelvic sarcoma, type 1, P2, P2 or P3, you cannot go for a posterior biopsy, then that is going to handle, uh, hamper your surgical field. So you always have to go like an ilioinguinal approach and in the line of the ilioinguinal scar, you have to direct your biopsy. So the original principles of biopsy applicable for all tumors that has to be followed with also the thought of which side, what is going to be your reconstructive option because this is an intralesional benign lesion. This is not a malignant lesion. It's a benign lesion. Intralesional surgery is being aimed at. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Pushpa, uh, some people have asked about uh, do you follow the normal tumor sequence of getting a CT in every case of uh, bone lesion. Does the CT have any role in differentiating GCT and its variants? CT as such has no uh, importance in uh, characterizing different bone tumors. It's mainly done by MRI. But uh, CT helps in um, surgical management, like uh, if there is any cortical breach, how much uh, cortical thickness is uh, preserved how much is the extent of bone destructed in the circumferential wise. So the cortical destruction and cortical details and tumor matrix can be seen well in CT. So CT helps in determining the exact variety of matrix, but um, only if it is not very evident on radiograph, CT will help. Otherwise, matrix can also be seen in radiographs. It's basically to look for cortical destruction and also the extent of cortical remain, cortex remaining in the bone for surgical management, surgical planning, I mean. That's the only uh, indication of CT, but we do take uh, limited CT for the region of bone involved once we are done with MRI. And what is your preferred method of following up at GCT? Uh, is it just an MRI is sufficient or you need a CT also? As I said, like uh, if it is a cortical-based uh, area, MRI gives excellent soft tissue contrast and everything. But if we have a slightest doubt, we also go to the CT scan. We also have a, um, a CT scan done to just to look for if there is any subtle lucencies which can be missed in uh, MRI if there is extensive metal artifacts and as such due to surgical changes. So uh, one of the slides you had mentioned that uh, it is impossible to comment on the aggressiveness of the tumor. And so people want to know whether, is it okay to do a PET scan so that you can, even before you start, you will know that this GCT is very aggressive or uh, malignant. There is also a question, will aggressive GCTs show differently on PET? Uh, no, actually none of the imaging modalities will tell you whether it is aggressive or benign. It only says there is a tumor and where the tumor is. Only histology can tell you whether it is aggressive, whether it is sarcomatous changes are there. Only histology can help you with it. PET scan and MRI, CT scan or X-ray, anything you take, it only tells you what is the extent of the disease and how the disease looks like? I mean, tumor looks like. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pushpa. Uh, Dr. Devendra, uh, yes, what is your uh, choice of grafts when you fill up? In case if you don't have a bone bank, how important it is to use autographs fully or is there a choice when you decide to use a cement would you just use cement exclusively or partially you can fill in 50% with autographs and then the other 50% with cement? So, uh, when the bone uh, allografts are not available, uh, we, can, we can still use uh, autographs in combination with cement 
the first uh, five millimeters of uh, uh, just underneath the cartilage, we can fill up the defect by using autografts taken from the iliac crest. And when once we are sure that the cement that is going to be placed there is not going to cause any thermal effect on the cartilage, we can fill up the rest of the defect by using uh, uh, bone cements. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, how do you, is there a surgical principle? I think you have already dealt with it, but there is a question on when do you decide on amputation when it is recurrent? Once it is recurrent, if, it is, if the limb is salvageable, if the bo bone lesion can be reconstructable, either by resection. I mean, uh, first principle is to completely clear the disease by resecting the whole tumor uh, by end block. That is the first principle. After that, uh, we need to look at how we, get, we are going to reconstruct the lesion. If it can be uh, reconstructed, I mean, salvaged by putting a, a pro tumor process, it is fine. Otherwise, if the lesion is quite extensive where uh, it is difficult to reconstruct, it is involving the whole soft tissue also then amputation is the best form of uh, salvaging the, uh, saving the life of the patients. Okay, thank you, Devin. There is one question on uh, how would you manage for a single level recurrence in the lumbar spine? So uh, the spine being a very exotic location, mainly because it houses the neural structure and also because of its close proximity to all the major vessels. It is sometimes a challenge to operate even on primarily for the first time in a virgin case. And the challenges become much compounded when you have to operate on a recurrence. So when you operate on a recurrence, the tumor has already transgressed all the uh, compartments and has infiltrated the psoas and the other muscles and so you are not actually aiming or it is impossible to do a radical resection. The only indication that you would operate again is that if the spine is very unstable, where you want to stabilize the spine and also to do a palliative decompression if the patient has got a neurological uh, deficit. So question of radical resection in a recurrence is impossible in the spine. And this is one area where denosubab actually comes into a larger picture, where you would use denosubab when there is no neurological deficit, primarily. If there is a neurological deficit, you would actually do a decompression stabilization and then use a denosubab. So there are a few questions for uh, Dr. Sunil. I think this was also discussed, but two people have asked, does denosubab reduce chances of recurrence of GCT? If so, should denisovab be added in all cases where you do an extended cure attach? So to be clear, surgery is going to be again the main stay of treatment. So we, uh, sur uh, there is no uh, treatment that to uh, replace an improper surgery. So denisovab does not reduce the recurrence rate. Uh, because of three reasons. One, it acts only on the stromal cells and osteoclast-mediated giant cells, and this is not tumoricidal. Second, it has to be only used for conversion cases where you need to convert a resectable or a difficult curable lesion into a, in a borderline case where you need to get, uh, get uh, denosumab in to convert it into a resectable lesion. So this does not, there has been a meta-analysis and a systemic review which clearly states that there is no reduction in uh, recurrence rate in these lesions. Okay. Uh, so if a patient is not able to afford denosumab, so is that okay? What is the difference in the uh, response by just putting them on alendronate? So the, the, the response rate, as I've shown, is uh, the difference between denosumab. Denosumab is in the wanted drug because once denosumab came into play in uh, 2012, the, all the studies that were uh, ongoing with uh, 
bisphosphonates got closed early and the response rate with bisphosphonate compared to donizumab uh, the difference is almost around 20 to 30% difference is, was there and the, it's mainly the adverse uh, effects of uh, zolan uh, I mean bisphosphonate that uh, prevent them from using when compared to donizumab and the cost difference is uh, around 3 to 4 times per setting yeah uh, what is the response of donizumab in the presence of infection so uh, uh, there are uh, two things uh, that has to be taken into consideration uh, one uh, whether the infection is if the infection is florid the donizumab should not be used in that uh, situation uh, so uh, we should go for uh, treatment either surgical or medical treatment for the infection only then uh, donizumab should be used in that those okay. patients uh in a post operative patient how long can denisumab be given safely i think you addressed that but after you give denisumab can you give put them on a long term follow up with the much cheaper drug of alendronate yes, sir uh, the thing is we don't have any uh, phase 3 evidence this is all retrospective uh, studies and uh, 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 so the duration of denizumab post treatment if you have treatment in neoadjuvant setting the most common uh, protocol that has been used is 6 months either monthly or 3 monthly so longer use, uh, usage uh, has not shown any uh, uh, more benefit and use of uh, zolendronic acid on long term has uh, not shown any uh, 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 survival benefit in these patients <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Sunil. Uh, <clears throat> so, with that, I would like to bring this uh, webinar to an end. I think this was one of the most comprehensive and well uh, detailed webinars on this subject of giant cell tumor. I would like to thank Dr. Raja Bhaskar, Dr. Pushpa, Dr. Devendra, and Dr. Sunil Kumar, and also Dr. Reddy's Labs for uh, initiating this program. And as ever, I think. Uh, Life changed for everybody after COVID, but I think it changed tremendously for Dr. Ashok Sham and Ortho TV. I mean, they are uh, as busier than ever before. In spite of that, thank you, Ashok, for uh, participating in this uh, webinar. And thank you, one and all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.